what makes ethical medicine so complicated is I think of almost all the things humans do. The urge to take care of the sick, to treat the sick, to heal the ill when we can, is one of our deepest, most basic moral urges. You see it in the religious traditions all over the world. We've all been sick, we've all known people who are sick, and that human sense of needing to care for them puts a strong, moral, positive note on anything we can do in medicine to make people better. And yet, as in everything in life, there have to be limits. Uh, someone told me a hypothetical I thought uh, illustrated that interestingly. Let's say you, you're in a hospital, you run a hospital, you have six patients. Two need kidney transplants, one needs a liver transplant, one needs a heart transplant, one needs lung transplants, one needs bone marrow transplants. They're all going to die soon if they don't get the transplants. And an otherwise healthy young person walks in with a broken arm who happens to be a perfect donor for all six of those. You could kill that person and save six lives. We won't do that, at least not yet. So there are moral limits, even on the very strong moral drive for health. Some of these questions are very old and have not been solved to everyone's satisfaction. Questions of, say, rationing scarce uh, resources, questions of organ transplantation, questions of the beginnings of life and the ends of life have been with us for thousands of years. They're with us in uh, somewhat different guises today, but we haven't solved them. But modern bioscience is introducing new questions, questions along the lines of, should we do genomic editing of humans? And if so, under what conditions and what circumstances? What do we think about growing human organs in non-human animals for transplant into humans? Uh, these and other questions have arisen as a result of, of biological advances. And they're not, the, the biological sciences are not slowing down. They're only going to present us with more dilemmas. We have approximately an hour. I can promise you that we're not going to solve any of them. <laughs> we're not even going to get a very good start on any of them. But I hope we can provide a useful introduction with very different viewpoints or significantly different viewpoints about what some of these issues are and engage in a discussion, not just with the five of us, but also with the audience. So let me start now by introducing the four panelists. Then I will ask each of them to speak in alphabetical order, although we're no longer sitting in alphabetical order, but I can figure that out. I'm a law professor. I can do that <laughs> in alphabetical order for about three minutes to give a first perspective. Then we'll have some discussion with them. I'll then open it to the audience to get some discussion going with you, and then we'll bring it back to the panel to close our session. Uh, our first uh, speaker by, our first panelist by alphabetical order is Dr. Michelle Dipp, who is the CEO of Ova Sciences, a firm in the UK dealing in reproductive health. Alphabetically, our second speaker is, all of the panelists are, are fascinating, but in some ways she's the most interesting because she's here, but she's not here. <laughs> Dr. Brooke Ellison is a professor of health policy and ethics at the State University of New York, Stony Brook. Uh, she is here courtesy of the Beam Machine. Uh, and if you haven't seen these before, so she's fascinating, and what she has to say is fascinating. But the device that brings her to us is also fascinating. And uh, it's good to see uh, Brooke here. Uh, Thank you. Our, our third panelist is Dr. Kathy Hudson. Uh, Kathy is the Deputy Director of the National Institutes of Health in the United States for Science, Outreach, and Policy. And last, alphabetically only, is Marcello Sanchez Sorondo, the Chancellor of the, Vatic of the Pontifical Academy of Sciences. So I'd like to go in alphabetical order with each of those four panelists and ask each to speak for about three minutes on something they think is particularly interesting around these questions these questions of ethical medicine. Michelle, you're first. Great, thank you, Hank. It's really wonderful to be here. Medicine really exists to serve patients, and it's something that you uh, just touched on. And patients are more connected than ever, um, and they're also global, as, as we can see. And so what better place in the World Economic Forum uh, to have a global, multidisciplinary dialogue about this? Because I think that's really what's needed. Um, so I'm excited about the, the next 
hour together. To take a step back, I'd like to talk a little bit about um, you know, where is science taking us, where is technology uh, taking us, and have we caught up yet in terms of the ethics, or is the science moving uh, more quickly than, uh, than the ethics? So when you think about where science and technology has taken us in the past, uh, medicine really has been in a different form, right? It's been in the form of drugs, uh, things that increase or decrease biomarkers that are associated with diseases, or devices. We think of things that can replace uh, perhaps arteries like a stent or perhaps a, a, a joint uh, like a hip replacement. And there were ethics around, um, and there still are ethical discussions around those, and you actually touched on that in your, in your story as well. But one of the things that we want to really talk about um, and something that I'm particularly interested in is now science and technology has taken us to genes, right, and, and gene editing. And so how do we even begin to frame the discussion? And I'll just throw out uh, one way to frame it. And that's really um, what can we actually do, and then we'll, we'll open it up for discussion later. We can do something to the entire organ or the tissue. So you've probably read about things like 3D printing. Um, so we can 3D print organs, we can um, grow tissue, or we can do something to the cell. We can now take adult stem cells and we can use what we know about the human genome to actually direct those adult stem cells to become certain types of cells. Or let's go one layer deeper. We can actually go into individual base pairs. So you've probably read a lot about a particular kind of technology. We have molecular scissors. Um, one example of that is called CRISPR. So on a gene basis or a base pair by base pair basis, we can now cut things out. So we know that there are certain diseases that are caused by, um, for example, certain base pair repeats. And we have the ability now to, to cut those out. And we can do that in a pretty reliable way. And that's what I'm sure you've, you've um, read a lot about. And then finally, and perhaps the thing that I'm the, the, the most excited about is there's a combination of those technologies. So what if, for example, you take an immature cell that you know carries a gene that causes a disease and you cut that out and then grow that cell into something. So for example, we know that there are um, immature egg cells in the body. You can now cut out a gene that causes a disease and then grow that into a fresh, young, healthy egg and then use that egg, for example, for in vitro fertilization or IVF. And in the UK, we know that they're, um, you know, they're, they're doing actually gene editing um, for the first time on human embryos. This is purely for research use, but the technology is there. So now we have to decide um, how to use it. So I just encourage us to have more discussions like this. I think it's really critical um, that we have these discussions on, at, at a global and multidisciplinary level. Thank you. Thanks. Brooke, your thoughts. Wonderful. Thank you for that introduction. It's a pleasure to you and to be here, uh, although remotely. Uh, I'm presenting from New York and uh, talking with all these brilliant minds about issues that have of such tremendous importance. Uh, so there's no doubt that we're on the precipice of a tremendous uh, revolution when it comes to medical research, uh, really in ways that can change what it means, what medicine means and disease means, and really what humanity means. Um, if you had the pleasure of hearing Vice President Biden speak yesterday, he spoke about the fourth industrial revolution and how biomedical innovation and research is really going to be a centerpiece of this, um, this transformation, new way of love approaching the world. And really, anybody who cares about science wants to see it um, approached in a way that is uh, just and has um, a mindfulness of the future and for the betterment of humanity. That's what I think all of us care about. And I think as we talk about these new medical uh, advances, biomedical advances and emerging technologies, there are very profound lessons that we can take from things that have happened in the past in biomedical research um, in the past, particularly in the field that I'm um, most closely associated with or have pursued most closely uh, stem cell research and how lessons from that field can really shape our thinking moving forward. 
So we can actually start by talking about um, really actually before the generation of the first embryonic stem cell way, way back in 1978, um, when the first uh, IVF baby was born or in vitro fertilization baby was born, Louise Brown. And at that time, immediately there were questions being asked about you know, what are the legitimate ends of science? Where should science be going where we feel comfortable? And um, there were questions about what, you know, what's called epistemic authority. So previously, you know, science didn't really delve too deeply into matters of you know, the creation of life or the origins of life. That was kind of areas that were owned by or kind of intellectually owned by institutions like religion. But then you know, science was kind of taking steps or you know, um, making advances in these these areas. And, you know, what I think was an important lesson that came out of that is that, you know, that we have kind of natural law ethics and religious perspectives on the meaning of life or the creation of life. Uh, but that's not really the only perspective or standpoint from which to view these kinds of technologies or these kinds of advances. We can look at them also from justice-based perspectives or utilit utilitarian perspectives that are equally as valid and equally as important. And then if we jump about 15 years ahead of that um, to the creation of what was called the Human Embryo Research Panel under the Clinton administration, and what that was was a panel of theologians and ethicists and legal scholars of different kinds who were put together to really start talking about and thinking about you know, what embryo research should really look like. And what I think was interesting about that is this team of intellectual experts came together and developed very sound and thoughtful recommendations about how this research should be pursued. But unfortunately, the recommendations weren't heeded as clearly as they should have been or could have been by policymakers at the time. And I think one important lesson to be learned from that scenario was, was that when you, especially when we're talking about science or issues where there's a diversity of opinion, having expertise as a measure of authority is really a very valuable stance to take that can help kind of cut through some of the noise and offer positions that we may not have been thought about, talked about quite as, as clearly. And then if we jump ahead again to 2001 during the Bush administration and the restrictions that were put on stem cell research at the time, um, it was kind of like morality was which was being legislated at the time. And um, what was very interesting about that, that, that time and that scenario was that um, while we have a diversity of opinion when it comes to the morality of the, the, the uh, the morality of the embryo, or the state of the embryo, or how do you view the, you know, the, the moral and legal rights of the embryo? Um, the restrictions that were put on that science were felt in much broader ways. I mean, that was the signature issue that came so became associated with embryonic stem cell research, but the, the repercussions were felt much more broadly beyond that issue in and of itself. Whereas when we had um, like concerns about the legitimacy of science more generally and where, where how far science should go and you know questions became um certain circled the authority of science more generally and that was very problematic in terms of getting people to be involved in science and how credible science was looked at and then a final point just to touch on was in 2007 with the development of ips cells and how many people at the time thought that that kind of nullified the, the necessity of embryonic stem cell research. And what was so critical at that time was you know, scientists needed to go out to the community, go out to the public and start kind of making a case for themselves and becoming ambassadors of their work and why their work was so important. And that's an important lesson to learn, I think, as we move forward with these emerging technologies as well, um, that scientists need to be active participants in this kind of public engagement and public conversation. And I think all of these things help to shape our thinking for the most important issue is the kind of the moral responsibility that we have to take our knowledge and take our learning and take all the wisdom that we've learned through science to make the world a better place. That's really what I think we're all here to do and to kind of alleviate some of the suffering that humanity continues to, to endure. And that's really what science is all about. Thank you, Brooke. Kathy. So I'm going to build on um, Brooke's reflections of the past and 
um, quote from George Santayana who said, those who can't remember the past are condemned to repeat it. And I think there's lots of lessons from the past. And as we're facing these new technological uh, enhancements and new ways of being able to manipulate uh, embryos and stem cells and DNA to remember that some of the fundamental ethical principles have remained unchanged. And so we, we need not reinvent some of these foundational ethical principles that I think many of us hold dear and on which many of us disagree. Um, so I'm going to start, uh, I'm going to have something that begins with A, something that begins with B, and something that begins with C. So my A is a silomar and recombinant DNA and a time when uh, investigators got together and said, whoa, we have this new powerful technology, uh, what does it all mean? And that gave rise to a set of guidelines that have actually accumulated um, amendments over the time to generate now voluminous guidelines for recombinant DNA. Uh, that include now uh, guidelines for how to do uh, uh, gene therapy and required oversight of gene therapy. It's time now, I think, in light of CRISPR and other technologies that we relook at those guidelines and, if nothing else, perhaps make them a little bit more comprehensible, uh, if not uh, longer. So many of the principles that were considered in the generation of those guidelines still apply today and still apply with CRISPR. Um, second, B, um, Belmont, both of these happened in February, one in uh, 1975 and one in 1976, a long time ago, and yet the lessons are still quite uh, applicable today. And what came out of the Belmont report, which was a uh, meeting of uh, the ethical uh, advisory panel in the U.S., was a set of regulations that apply for all human research with human beings as research participants. But at that time, the sort of stance and relationship between medicine and research participants or patients was quite different than it is today. At that time, uh, medicine was more paternalistic. Research was clearly more paternalistic. And so the time has come to sort of re-examine how we think about interacting with human beings in research with the underlying goal to uh, do research that can extend and enrich life. And the thing that begins with C is chimera, and this is a topic that's near and dear to uh, Hank's heart, um, and speaking of hearts. Um, so it is heart. possible with stem cell technology and, uh, and embryology and genetics to be able to potentially uh, make an animal-human chimera, and a chimera is a, a mixture of two organisms, um, and uh, potentially be able to have, for example, a pig that has a human heart. Uh, in order to do that, you need to know an awful lot about what, uh, what the potential is, and also you need to know an awful lot about what may go wrong. And so uh, we have been spending some time thinking about that at the NIH in order to have the appropriate kinds of guidelines in place for the research that we fund. And so this is an interesting area of research that we are exploring as well. So at the NIH, our job is to support research that can extend and enrich life, uh, and that includes research that can help identify what are the boundaries and policy issues and ethical issues that we as uh, a U.S. society and a global community really need to think about. And so it's fun to join you here today and, and have a discussion about these issue, issues. Thank you, Kathy. Marcella. Thank you. Welcome to all people. I am very happy to be here and thank you for the invitation. Uh, we need to consider that the ethics are two parts, we can say, to simplify things. One is the individual ethics, and this is uh, a question of the person. But the other is the social ethic, and we say the, the, the more important virtue of the social ethic is the justice. And one of the problems today in, in the question of, of medicine is that uh, many of the things that we experiment is for the rich people and not for the poor, not for the majority of the people of the world. We have a meeting recently in the academy that uh, the conclusion was that the poor people live not in the same condition and not the same time than the rich people. 
And this is the majority of the population. That is to say, one of the real, in the contemporary world, in, in the society today, more important question is, what can we do for the, all these new instruments of, of the science and the technology arrive to all people? And this, for me, is a real ethical question, very important ethical question. But we can come back to the other part of the ethics. In the, in the academy, we have many meetings. For example, about the last one was in biology about the induct cells. And, and this is a fantastic thing. And, and it's completely uh, the, that open a new completely uh, medicine that you, we say, and uh, not palliative medicine, but uh, real uh, renew medicine, because renew the cell. And, uh, and this is a very important thing. We have another meeting about what is the state of death. And we arrived to the conclusion that that is the brain death. I don't know if you have the same idea. And uh, of course, the question of the beginning of the life, the, the difference is that we consider that the human are persons, and human persons, and this is to say that have a soul, and this is to say have an intelligence, this is to say have a dignity and freedom, and we consider that the body is informed by the soul, and for this reason we consider that the body, human body is a very special thing, and it's impossible to self. The body, or the part of the body. This is more or less the guys lines that we can, we can discuss. I understand that they, there are many new things, of course. We study, we try to study and to, to be a La Page in the new things, and we can discuss. Great. Thank you. Well, thank you. So it, it's interesting, uh, I think it was Kathy who said that we have these ethical principles that we uh, have held for a long time and they haven't changed, but we don't always agree on them. Uh, <laughs> I actually think we probably do agree on one of them, the one Marcelo brought up at, uh, at the beginning of his comments on justice and the idea of uh, trying to alleviate the unjust inequities, even within a rich country like my own. Certain people's, people from some groups live 15 years shorter lives than people from other groups. They're citizens of the same country. Uh, they are, in theory, all uh, have ex access to all the same spectacular biomedical health care, and yet those disparities exist. And you look across the world in 15 years between, say, Iceland or Japan, two of the longest-lived countries, and some of the, some of the poorest countries, uh, the gap is probably closer to 40 years rather than 15. I suspect we all agree on that. Unfortunately, that seems to be the hardest thing for us to make progress on, mm -hmm. uh, but I hope we will keep that in mind. I think sometimes bioethics gets distracted by the sexy, new, exciting biomedical research. I love it myself, but questions of longer standing questions on which in theory we all agree, uh, we need to pay more attention to putting those into practice. Uh, one of the great things about being a moderator is I get to ask questions and I don't have to answer them. <laughs> <laughs> or I don't have to force myself to answer them. So I'm gonna put a question on the table for the four uh, of the panelists. And I'm going to pick a particular technology, but it's not so much the technology that I'm interested in, but your way of approaching it. How would you go about thinking about whether this technology was ethical or not? And I also want you to keep two levels in mind. Ethical in terms of would you do it for yourself? Is it something you would feel comfortable with? But on the other hand, would you legislate such that other people could or couldn't do it. So there's the social level, I think slightly differently from what you had in mind, but there's a social level of is this a good idea as well as a personal level. Uh, let's talk a little bit about um, mitochondrial transfer, a technology sometimes to me annoyingly called three-parent babies. Uh, this is a situation that is under investigation to help women who have defects in DNA in parts of their cells called the mitochondria. 
So we know about the 46 chromosomes in your DNA. That's the DNA in the nucleus of your cells. But your cells also have these little, the high school term is the energy powerhouse of the cell. These little things that have their own DNA. And that DNA can go wrong, and it can cause disease. And unfortunately, every child born to a woman with that disease-causing DNA will get the same disease-causing DNA. We all only get our mitochondrial DNA from our mothers. So researchers, particularly in the United Kingdom, but not exclusively there, have been working on trying to take the nuclear genome, most of the genes and cells of a woman who has this mitochondrial disease, and combine it with the mitochondria from a woman whose mitochondria do not have these genetic defects, and allow her for the first time to have a healthy child, or at least a child who doesn't have that disease. Might have other diseases, but who doesn't have the mitochondrial disease. So uh, the UK just held a parliamentary vote last year and decided to approve case-by-case -case licensure of research uh, after further study. I don't think they've granted their first license yet, but I believe they're it's expected that decision will be made fairly soon. How would you think about the ethics of mitochondrial transfer? And I'll open that to anyone who wants to go first, but one of you has to. <laughs> so, so I'll start. Um, I think one of the key considerations here is, uh, you talked about um, enabling a woman to give rise to a healthy child. And I guess the key consideration here is whether or not the technique in and of itself has risks associated with it, and do we understand what those risks are? In the UK, there is a, a panel that is, has been advising the government and, and putting in place sort of um, a governor on what kinds of research and clinical practice moves forward. Unfortunately, in the United States, we don't have that. So we have a full out ban on anything that um, might um, harm or alter a human embryo. And in some ways, that strict prohibition has restricted our ability to really explore these issues about the safety of some of these reproductive technologies. But I think the key ethical issue for uh, mitochondrial transfer is what are the consequences for the resulting child in terms of their uh, health and well-being? Okay, so safety issues. And I suspect everyone at this round table, at this round uh, platform, <laughs> we're sitting on a table. Everybody at this uh, round platform would agree that safety is at least a relevant and important issue. Are there other issues that, would you, that you would think about in approaching the question whether this was ethical or not? Sure, I'd like to just time. jump in there for a second. Hank, um, it's really off of what Kathy had just said. Um, you know, I'm very much in agreement that you know, mitochondrial transfer is one of the biggest advances of biomedical research and one of the greatest opportunities to address uh, mitochondrial disorders and, and try to eradicate a lot of these uh, conditions that have been plaguing families and children for, for quite so long. But what I think is also very important to think about is one of the kind of reflexive arguments that's made when it comes to um, concerns about uh, emerging technologies is kind of this you know, slippery slope or fatalistic perspective of science, kind of this precautionary principle that you know, if we take one step, then it's going to lead to some disastrous outcome. And I think that that's not really fully accurate and something that we need to think a little bit more um, discerningly about as a society, that just because we take one step doesn't mean it's going to ultimately lead to some disastrous or dire outcome. And taking the initial steps is so important, it's so critical to the advancement of science. And if there's some outcome that we are wary of, we can put um, kind of precautions or, or bans on that particular outcome or that aspect of the scientific pursuit, but not, for, not um, prohibit or place a moratorium or anything like that on the basic science that needs to get to that point. So you'd worry about the next steps, but you think there's, mm -hmm. there are other ways to handle them rather than prohibiting the first steps. Exactly. Okay. Marcelo. Uh, I think it's more easy to have the transfer, to have the induction of the gene. Uh, because as you know, in the gene, there are many, many things we say not express, and we can express this Think that are in the gene that that need this dispersion. This this is the new method of induction. So that's interesting. You might so you're saying we should first explore 
things that would involve um, because the transfer is, is is complicated also technically because uh, to, to the it's, it's easy to reject the transfer mm -hmm. and uh, in the contrary if you uh, self activate the, the part of the gene uh, this is uh, this is the line of the that we work in the in duct cells we we have the, the Japanese to invented this in the academy and, and, and he's playing this that great, I think this is a really uh, a, great, a great news and, and, and a very important future. And already they use this for many tissues, and, uh, but it's very complicated for, 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 the, for the nervous tissue. Right. But the other tissues go. Yeah, I don't know whether it would work for the mitochondrial DNA defects in question, but it's something that uh, one could explore. But, sure. would, oh. but it would be difficult to do that exploration without being able to do research on embryos themselves. So there's a little bit of a, ch a challenge there, isn't there? The embryo, you know, uh, the activation of the of this, uh, we can uh, we can reproject age cells of the of the of the of the body. With this, with this new method, and uh, we are right to have a cell not in the same stage of the of the of the of the embryon cell, but in this in the in the but with this maybe with the similar potentiality, and uh, is when the cell arrive to one day, I think uh, we we distinguish between. And the total potence, as you know, and and pluripotence, and it's pluripotence, but have all the possibilities that have the, the embryo cell. Michelle. Yes. So uh, you know, it's an interesting one. I mean, Kathy, as as you were pointing out, I mean, when we think about um, mitochondrial transfer, it's what we're thinking about here is being able to replace the entire um, organelle which contains that genome. Um, and in what they're doing in the UK does require the egg to be fertilized first. So the egg is fertilized and then the transfer of the nucleus takes place into that donor egg, into an egg with healthy um, mitochondria in order to avoid it. And so the ethical considerations that, that come about are, number one, as a result of the actual technical, um, what you need to technically perform, so the fertilized egg itself. And then the second, um, one thing that I haven't heard uh, yet that is another ethical uh, consideration is you're now mixing the DNA from two different women. And what does that mean for uh, those children. So that's just, you know, another um, topic that I know has, has uh, come up in terms of the, the ethics of it, aside from, of course, all the scientific safety aspects. Although it is fair to point out that all of us up here uh, have DNA from two women and two men, our grandparents, and four women and four men, our great-grandparents. Yeah, and, and lots of microbes. And yeah. lots of other things sneaking <laughs> in there from time to time. Um, so there's another side to that quest to this question, and again, I'm using the mitochondrial transfer just as an example that I think could apply to other things. How should a society go about trying to make this decision? And we touched on a little bit. The UK has a body. Uh, actually, it took a long time considering these issues before there was a parliamentary vote. Had a parliamentary vote. Now has a post-vote study. The United States doesn't have anything like that. Different countries have very different kinds of bioethics regulatory systems. Uh, if, if you were in charge, how would, what kind of system would you set up for a country to decide what its position should be on some of these new advances? Well, I'm happy to, you know, to, to jump in. Well, okay. um, you're touching on some of the points that I had made in my, kind of my opening. Um, Remarks. Yeah, I, I think that the United States, in particular, um, kind of in the context of, of many democracies, has has not given as much attention as it possibly could to the importance of of expertise. Right. So, um, 
putting together committees or assembling um, panels of scientists and ethicists and theologians and legal scholars and philosophers and, and really talking about having thoughtful conversations about really what's at the heart of these debates is going to be so valuable and then taking recommendations and actually trying to make them matters of public policy i think that's where the challenge is going to be um very often in the united states um uh, Policy is tied to funding, and that's what's made um, a lot of issues very complicated in the United States. But I, I think when it comes to the future of science, we really need to be take a little bit more of a thoughtful approach and to, to lean more heavily than we have on the importance of expertise and and thoughtful dialogue and challenging one another's points of view when it comes to um, how to talk about very complicated science and very for the ethical challenges. Okay. Other thoughts? I think, so, yeah, I mean, I, I completely agree, Brooke. I think that the UK is a great example, um, as is Japan, in terms of bringing those types of groups together to have those discussions around safety and around slippery slope, um, which are the two main things that I think people are always focused on. So, you know, it was interesting to see the UK think through, I guess, using, again, mitochondrial transfer as the example, of course, the safety um, aspects of the technique itself that's being um, performed, and that's why it's uh, for research use for now, but also the slippery slope aspect. So do you, I don't think any of us would disagree that um, we know that a baby born to a mother that knows that they have uh, a mitochondrial disorder, that baby um, is, could die within the first year of life um, or could be blind or, you know, there's um, you know, over 200 mitochondrial disorders. It's, I think we're all on the same page in terms of, of course it makes sense to allow for that technique to be used uh, for that. But we also know that um, improving the number of functioning mitochondria probably also improves success with IVF. And so that was the slippery slope argument that they had, which mm -hmm. is, well, what happens if people start using this in IVF? What happens if everyone starts using this? That's why there was so much um, discussion and debate. And so, um, you know, to your point, um, Brooke, there, you know, there are ways to say, okay, um, as a society, we want to look at the safety. We bring a multidisciplinary group together to decide on that. And in terms of how we actually bring this to patients, you know, in our country, there are ways to regulate it such that it's appropriate for these types of patients, but not for these types of patients. Now, how we make those decisions is a, is a tough one. What criteria do we use? Do we leave it in the hands of the experts? <laughs> do we trust it to the legislatures? Our host country uh, recently had a referendum, Switzerland had a referendum on certain uses of genetic testing. I'm a Californian. We love, we love referendums, although we don't necessarily always love the results of the referendum. So um, there are a variety of different paths people can take uh, in terms of how to, how to reconcile, how, to, how, how should democracies deal with questions that are both technically very taxing and also ethically uh, challenging that not every member of the country will have the same views on. And those are things I think all of our countries uh, need to think about and work on. I think the first thing is to know well the question, to know well the question mm -hmm. of the point of view of science and of point of view of the experience of this, of this way, and after discuss with the society, with the other professions, the other jobs, and, uh, and in the end to arrive to, to, the, to the law. But <laughs> the law need to be do with the people to know the questions because this <laughs> many times. For example, another thing uh, in the in the meeting of the COP 21 about climate change, all are diplomatics and lawyers and not scientific people. Mm -hmm. yeah, of course, this is good, but <laughs> we need scientific people. In the contrary, we don't know exactly the reality. Yeah. And I think one thing we all need is for the experts in different areas, I mean, legal experts, political experts, exactly. scientific experts, we need to be able to talk to each other. Uh, Aristotle uh, said that to take decisions, we need discuss. 
Yes. They know things. And, and to discuss, we need to be able to speak the same language. And I'm not just spe talking about English here, but yes. biology is a somewhat different language from law, which is a different language from Most theology and from philosophy. Uh, one of the things that makes interdisciplinary work so exciting, but also so challenging, is getting to know the other fields. Well, speaking of knowing other fields, we should know something about the other people in the room or at least what interests you. So let's take some questions. I believe there will be a microphone uh, passed around. One sure, one more thing. To the first question, uh -huh. the question of justice. I think that it's very important today to, uh, to, to, to point uh, in, in the question of education of the people. Mm. Because really, the, to, to, to know what is the, the news that we have, and uh, the form that we can arrive to have this real news in, in the medicine and, and in relation to, to the health. In the contrary, really, uh, we, don't, we don't know in, in many countries that I know, in the, in the curriculum, we don't, <laughs> we don't have really information about the question of health. And I think this is a very important question. And also to resolve the problem of the poverty, uh, one of the way also in this, in this area is education. Well, those of us on the panel who are teachers certainly agree with you. And I suspect those who aren't teachers agree with you as well. But I think that also the doctors, all the, all the, all the people to work in, in medicine need to be more communicative uh, and not to, to be only in, in, he, in, his, in, his, in his world. And in a way, that goes back to the language issue, because it's so easy to talk in your own language, the medical language or the biologist language, and you think you're communicating, but the rest of the world, you might be speaking Greek, and there might not be other Greek speakers out there. Sorry, interdisciplinarity. Yeah. So any questions from the audience? Yes. Willie, I'm from Taiwan. I was wondering uh, uh, how does this debate compare to, let's say, in 1950s when we, we started uh, organ transplant? Mm -hmm. so, anyone want to uh, take on the organ transplant question? Really a little bit later than that. It was more the late 60s. So the first transplants were in the 50s, but only if you were lucky enough to have an identical twin who had uh, the same uh, kidney. Um, Okay. So I'll, I'll take a stab at this and really want to echo the justice issues that you talked about. You know, when you look at the availability of organs and, and how, uh, how well we have uh, communicated to citizens how important it is to make their organs available after their death to others, um, there's a huge, in the United States, there's a huge racial disparity in the availability of organs for transplant, and that's a justice issue uh, that is fundamental. And if we could devote as much science and technology to overcoming that barrier as we do to some of these other issues of less import, that would be substantial. The other, you know, um, where you see an, um, sort of an intersection of transplantation issues and, um, and embryonic fetal issues is in this issue of fetal tissue research and fetal tissue transplantation. And that has become a big political issue in the United States very recently, where um, there were uh, allegations of um, uh, uh, harvesting fetal tissue uh, for research in unethical ways. And that resulted in a nearly um, blocked uh, funding for the entire federal government, which was pretty unprecedented. Um, so those, it, that's an interesting example of when these issues get conflated and confused. Um, but I think the biggest issues around transplantation right now are really the, of, of organs, is around um, the availability and the justice issues. I would agree with that. I would agree with that completely. And um, I think in addition to that, 
Um, what I think was kind of central to the organ transplantation debate early on and, and what we see kind of being echoed to this day is this question of kind of like Franken science, right? How far does science go? Where does it become morally repugnant? And I think that is a very kind of subjective and um, not a particularly helpful line of thought to go down because there are such a there is such a diversity of opinion when it comes to what what is considered morally repugnant or dangerous or frank in science. Um, you know, when we're talking about what can potentially benefit humankind and and all of humanity, I think that's where we should be focusing most of our attention. I think that argument doesn't get made quite as strongly as it possibly can in a lot of these kinds of debates. I do think that there are some other interesting issues in the early days of organ transplantation. And really echoing Brooke to some extent, there were people who were afraid that if they were male and they got a woman's heart, that it would change their essence in some way, uh, which was not expected to be the case and has thus far not turned out to be the case. There were people who thought if they got a heart from a person of a different race, that would change them. Um, so there were some popular beliefs that weren't in line with the science that did have some effect. But there also are some, there were some genuine safety issues. Uh, and you, know, there's a, you have to, I think the hardest thing anyone has to, one of the hardest things to do has to be to decide when is this ready to try for the first time in humans? Because no matter how many times you've tried something in non-humans, the only way you know whether it works in humans is to try it and you can never be sure. There was recently, just last week, the disaster in France with the drug trial. They'd done that in non-humans. I think they'd even done it in non-human primates. And try it in humans, and terrible things happen. So particularly in organ transplantation, or even more primitively in blood transfusions, yeah, there were a lot of people killed before people realized what ABO blood types and RH positive and negative blood types are. So the safety issues, but also public understanding issues. Another question. Yes. Um, I'm Anna Lopez. I'm from Toronto, Canada. Um, I wanted to uh, ask you about end of life, and I know it's one of those, but um, in Canada, um, the Supreme Court has just given the Canadian government another four months to sort of think about the legislation, but I think you're going to see countrywide legislation in Canada in about five or six months that will allow doctor-assisted suicide. Um, and things that happen in Canada across have a way of sort of permeating down and um, affecting how you think in, even in the United States. So just your comments um, about that. Um, and it, does, it will completely transcend the justice issue because everyone will have access to it in the country. It won't matter if you're poor or rich, everyone has a doctor and will be able to make that decision themselves. So um, just your thoughts on that. I, I would note that not everything from Canada permeates quickly south, like universal health care still hasn't made still it hasn't made its all way the down. way. <laughs> but we're becoming a little more Canadian. <laughs> You, you raised that issue. I think we do, we do death really badly. Um, and uh, my dad died a couple years ago, and when he was dying, I had to sit the whole panoply of physicians and healthcare providers down and, and force them to acknowledge that he was not going to survive. Right? I should not have been the person to do that. And then I had to convince my family that that was also the case. That, I should not have been in that position. So these people who are so... Um, driven to cure who can't see when they can't. And so that's sort of the first step, right? We can't allow somebody to uh, make the option of assisted suicide if we can't even get to the point where we can acknowledge you're not going to survive. And, and what do we do around that? You know, there was recently an Institute of Medicine report on uh, dying in America, and it talked about. Um, uh, palliative care and hospice care and other kinds of care and basically said that those um, areas of medicine have really grown up and been acknowledged as specialties by the American Medical Association and others because of a failure of the rest of medicine to deal with death. So we have a huge uh, way to go before we make the end of life, even aging, making aging dignified and worthwhile and meaningful. We, we're not there yet, right? Speak for yourself. <laughs> <laughs>
right? I, I think I'm right with that with that position. Um, guys, I think it's I think um, the uh, assisted suicide kind of uh, end of life decision making has been one of these debates that's very much mired in this epistemic authority kind of disjuncture as who who has the right to say when a life should be. Over. And I think that's been a very unfortunate way to characterize this very complex and very difficult kind of conversation to have. And I, I think um, when it comes to matters of who has the right to say when the life can be over, in addition to kind of this almost paternalistic approach that, that things like the American Medical Association or medicine in general has taken to the kind of the physician-patient relationship has really made these conversations very difficult to have very unfortunately difficult to have. Um, you, nobody should be placed in the position where they feel like that decision is taken out of their control. Very often when you're facing disease or disability, so much has already been taken out of your control. To not be able to make this very central and important decision, I think, is very unfortunate. And there has been, it's been a tremendous blight on the U.S. healthcare system. Um, you know, it's caused all sorts of problems, not just for families, but for the entire healthcare system in general. And I um, I think it causes unnecessary heartache that um, we really need to be talking much more openly and comfortably about. Marcella. Well, I think that in many countries, I don't know in your country, really, because uh, they changed. I'll, I'll tell you a little bit about it after you're done. Yeah, I think my country's but, interesting uh, right the, now on this. For me, the virtuous uh, way is that is opposite to two, two different extremes. One is to, to anticipate the death. We are sure that these people go to the death, and in this case, I anticipate the death for some reason. And the other extreme is to, to give an artificial <laughs> life uh, to a person that is dead. <laughs> and for this, uh, we studied many times this problem in the academy, and we arrived uh, with a neurologist that to say the, the criteria could be the brain death, that I think this is the criteria of Harvard. No? And uh, the, when the brain is dead, it's, 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 it's the death of the person. And, and fortunately, we, we are lucky because it was in the time of the Pope Benedict. And uh, Paul Benedict loved St. Augustine. And we, we find a text of St. Augustine that say, when the brain is dead, the soul goes to the body. <laughs> uh, that sounds very much like law American lawyers. You, like Justice Holmes, you find a quote from Justice Holmes. But uh, the United States situation is an interesting one, and I think particularly in comparison with Canada. About 15 years ago, the U.S. Supreme Court, actually it was longer than that, 20, 20, 25 years ago, the U.S. Supreme Court was presented with the opportunity to decide there was a, a constitutional right that would apply to all Americans to control the circumstances of their death. The U.S. Supreme Court at that point decided not to. 20 year, almost 20 years ago, the state of Oregon, one of our 50 states, legalized physician-assisted uh, aid in death. Uh, the state of Washington followed about eight years ago. Vermont followed a couple of years ago. My own state followed last year. But there are 50 states, and uh, five have now legalized it to some extent, three by legislation, one by a referendum, and one by a judicial opinion. The other 45 states, I think some of them will join them and some of them won't. Of the states as laboratories, right? So, so what's yeah. the what's the experience? That been? would be Justice Brandeis' quote: "The states <laughs> as the laboratories of democracy." That's right. That's right. So, so what have we learned from the experience of the families and the individuals in those states where this is, and from the perspective of uh, physicians as well? What's what's? So I, I think it's 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 interesting, and as a lawyer, I'm almost legally required to say that uh, to, the first two words in any answer should always be "it depends." Um, <laughs> I think we have learned that the details make a difference, but that at least in the Oregon situation, which has been going on for almost 20 years, there, seems, there seem to have been few, if any, abuses um, and no real expansion. But in comparison, 
and I, I hope I get this right, if there's anyone here from the Netherlands or from Belgium, in Netherlands and, and Belgium, they've had uh, both physician-assisted suicide and actual euthanasia, not just assisted suicide, but the physician ending someone's life, and those have expanded uh, in the number of people used and uh, the number of people who use them and in the indications for them. So the cultures seem to make a difference in how far we go. The details make a difference. Uh, and I do think this is one, at least in my country, in our country, where the laboratories of democracy, having the different states, not only try different things, but you know, Mississippi is not the same as California, is not the same as Vermont, is not the same as North Dakota. So, at, at the international level as well, I think some of these questions, there's no one right answer for every country. Uh, part of uh, what we need to think about is what things are universal and what things are more rooted in culture. Well, I'm, I, a, a quick question and a very quick answer. And, and please identify yourself. Sorry. And I was thinking, even before you get to the point of, say, physician-assisted suicide or euthanasia, um, along with what you said, we really still have a long ways to go in terms of end-of-life care. Because even without that, where do you draw the line in terms of palliative care, in terms of hospice? Because even though finances aren't the be-all and end-all, they are significant. And health care costs are a major burden in our country. Uh, and we know that a lot of Medicare dollars, maybe 50% of Medicare dollars are spent in the last three months of life when we knew from the beginning that that person probably didn't really have any meaningful life left, whatever, however you want to define that. But I think we still need to address those issues even if we aren't supporting physician-assisted uh, suicide or death. Uh, great point, and I, I think those are, again, coming back to some of the justice issues of, of allocating our resources in a way that is just, uh, that treats people well and makes the best use of them. Our resource, of course, the scarcest of all resources is time, and we are just about out of time. I would like to get one sentence from each of the panelists, one sentence that you would most like your, our audience to remember from your thoughts, and not a long sentence. No, I can say one thing. The golden rule, the golden rule. And this, we need to, to be in the position of the people, for example, in the case of, of the dead. Uh, if you want to anticipate the death or not, if you are conscious, this is the question. We need to do to the other the things that we want to do to do to, to yourself. Mm. This is the golden rule. And especially this is for all people. Yeah. Extension of the new things for all people, this I think is the more important. A very old idea that applies to very new circumstances. I would say that we need more platforms like this. So I would encourage us to continue these kinds of discussions so that we have you know, global multidisciplinary discussions. Rook, do you have a sentence? Sure. So I think we as individuals and as societies should want science to advance and we should want it to be a vehicle of translating human suffering into human potential. And if through biomedical research we're given the chance to make the world a better place and to alleviate suffering, then we really must try. I think that's a run-on sentence, but I'll allow it. <laughs> <laughs> Kathy. So I think we should focus on um, those issues and challenges that are real, really widespread and, um, and focus disproportionate attention on those. We tend to get distracted by the new sexy and sensational, where in the long term those will probably have a little real impact on our lives. And my last sentence is to ask you and to join me in thanking our four panelists for what I think has been a great hour. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Chairman.